Okay, I'd like to start off my presentations with this slide right here. This is a picture of the immediate family. Um, and the reason why I put this on here is because it's so important that you have the support of all of your family members and, and your team members. I don't call uh, them employees, I call them team members. They're part of the team. And it's so important that you have, have all the support. And right there in the front center is the best thing that happened in 2020 is those two beautiful grandchildren. So um, it's been it's been a good it's been a good run and the future looks good. I'm a graduate from uh, Purdue University and the School of Ag Economics. I'm a fifth generation farmer, as Andrew mentioned. Uh, I've been practicing now for about 37 years. My beautiful wife Carol for 32 years. Two beautiful daughters, Jessica and Rachel. Um, I've got Rachel and her husband on the farm. Jessica has married. Uh, another farmer, and they are on, they are on their family farm, so uh, it's all stayed in the family. The, the farming blood is in the family. Um, on the farm is my father Richard, and and I can't thank my dad enough. He has taught me how to think and and be quick on your feet, and that's what this takes if you're going to go down this journey. Uh, we have to be ready to change at a moment's notice. Uh, my nephew Aaron is also on the farm. We've been no-tilling soybeans for 17 years, no-tilling corn for 12, cover crops for 12, and farming green for 10. And I'm going to explain the farming green in, in just a little bit with more detail. Okay, at home, most of our neighbors are on a two-crop rotation, corn and soybeans. We have gotten this up to a six-crop system. I don't like to call it a rotation because it just varies on where you are in, in, in the system on where your cash crop's gonna land. Uh, those six crops are corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, yellow field peas, and, and livestock. And the plus one is a regen. And regen is when you take an acre out of production and you do not raise a cash crop on that acre and you give it full attention for a cool season cocktail followed by a warm season cocktail and then the cocktail that you want to have for your cash crop for the following year. Now, when I'm presenting to folks that are in the Northern states, I mentioned a couple things here that are gonna be beneficial. The regen and a, a cereal grain. We need these to make the opportunity to get that, uh, that cover crop established because too many times I hear the excuse, I live too far north, it's too cold here, we can't do it here, it doesn't work, I don't have enough time. All of those, those two options take all of those two excuses away. And we, can, we cannot think of that regen year as a zero. We are building soil health, we are building uh, organic matter, we are increasing water holding capacity, we are doing all of the right things toward making the, the, the efforts toward giving that next cash crop all of the success that it, that it needs. We are currently uh, have 1200 acres certified organic and the remainder of the farm is in transition. Now this is not going to be an organic presentation, but you will see that if you want to come along the journey with me and come part of the way, I'm going to show you how we can save some money. Now, I'm over here on an island all, almost by myself. I'm not all the way by myself, but I'm over there with not very many participants. Uh, you know, not only organic here, but we're doing this with no tillage. So this is very intense, very forward thinking, very hard. And if you don't want to come that way, fine, but let's work on eliminating some inputs and increasing your ROI. So it's about seven years now, we haven't used any starter fertilizer, fungicides, seed treatments, or insecticides. We haven't applied any P or K or any ag lime in also seven years. How can you do this? Well, there's many ways. Uh, first of all, it takes time. We've been at this about 15 years now. So 
you just can't go out this spring and start pulling away inputs. It's not going to work. You have to build soil health. You have to start pulling away some of the other inputs and, and start bringing them down. And then you start to eliminate total. How can we uh, not apply ag lime in seven years? Well, by eliminating the salts and the acids from those synthetic fertilizers, we no longer need that lime to get our pH back to where it needs to be. We just got our last round of soil tests. Everything on every field is either where it was fertility wise three years ago or it's higher and the pH is 6.8. Those are all validations that what we're doing is correct. We've not applied any nitrogen on corn acres in the last two years and that includes manure. Everything is done as natural as possible. When you become organic certified, there's an organization called, it's OMRI, the acronym is O-M-R-I, and, and it's, a, it's a body that determines which products are, they are going to allow you to apply to a certified organic acre. We do not apply anything. Even if it meets that approval, we're not applying it. I'm trying to do this as natural as possible. And I mentioned earlier, we are doing this organically with no tillage. So this, this leads into my 70-30 rule. We are trying to, to grow cover crops and grow biomass. It's all about biomass. And we're trying to get seven, eight, nine, 10,000 pounds of biomass and 70% and of the weed suppression will come from that biomass and the other 30% of the wheat suppression is coming from the cash crop canopy. So we are planning on 20 inch corn row spacing and 20 inch soybean spacing. I need these cash crops to get to canopy as soon as possible to complete this 70-30 ratio that I've come up with for the wheat suppression. Farming green. Planting the cash crop of corn and soybeans into a green growing cover crop. Termination may not occur for up to 30 days, but typically it will happen within three to five. In this video that's running right now, we are planting corn. Now, we don't do this now because I do not use any synthetic nitrogen, but this is very doable in, a, in an operation that still wants to use some, some synthetic fertilizer. What we have to understand here is that at this point in its growing cycle, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is at least 70 to one. So once we understand that it's at that high of a ratio and we understand how much power in sequestration that cereal rye has, we then understand we need to move nitrogen into the front side of this, pro of this system. Again, I do not do this now because I can't get that nitrogen out there. But if you still wanted to use some AMS, I, that's the one we used to use for two reasons. The ammonium is more stable and it has sulfur and almost every field needs sulfur. Benefits of farming green. And by the way, there's the picture of that same field. We rolled that field down with a roller crimper. That's how we terminated that uh, cereal rye and that eliminated a burn down pass. So right there, we can start to reduce the glyphosate load and start to think about building soil health by removing that burn down load. Okay, we are spending sometimes upwards of $40 an acre on these, these cover crop cocktails. The last thing I wanna do is go out and burn all this to the ground on the first warm day of spring. It, it, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. We have to maximize what this cover crop was intended to do for us. In other words, farming green. Sequestration of nutrients. Cereal grains are tremendous at sequestering nutrients. I've got a slide coming that's gonna show this. Nitrogen fixing. If you've planted a legume like a Balanza fixation clover from Grassland, Oregon, if you've planted that that legume in the fall and you've given it time in the fall to get established, I like to get to third trifoliate before the first freeze. 
if you can get all this accomplished in the fall and you can and you get it to come out and survive in the spring, we don't want to terminate it when it's just getting ready to jump into full stride. I've got a slide coming in a little bit. It's going to show you the power of it. Growing carbon. That's the whole buzz right now are these carbon markets. Well, these practices right here are exactly what these carbon markets are looking for. Building soil health, reducing or eliminating tillage, reducing or eliminating chemicals, being a good steward to the land. That's all this fits together. Erosion control. I don't care where you live or where you farm, there is erosion. Wind erosion, water erosion. Increased pounds of biomass. I already talked about this. This is the world that I live in now. As you can see by looking at that picture, 70% of the wheat suppression is coming from that, that thatch or that mulch that we laid down. And that corn is almost a canopy. Matter of fact, it's starting because you can see shading down there. That's going to suppress the other 30% of the time. Feeding the microbes with root exudates, this above ground mulch is, is being eaten up by the microbes. We have to continually feed them diversity. Armor the soil. We have to protect the soil from the beating down sun. The sun is the most, it's the cheapest and the most powerful energy source we have, but it can also be detrimental to our soil and our microbial biome if we don't have the armor on the soil. Limit evaporation. We've worked so hard to build soil health, build organic matter, increase water holding capacity, increase water infiltration rates, increase aggregate stability. We worked hard for all of these things. So when we get our, our profile filled with that moisture, we want to armor it with that thatch to limit the evaporation so we can save that moisture for our cash crop when it becomes hot in July and August. Suppress weeds, that's the world that we live in now. We need to suppress the weeds. Here's the power of cereal rye. I, have, I need to set this up. This field was corn in the fall. We came in and on this particular study, we, uh, we no-till drilled 80 pounds of Elbon cereal rye. It grew in the fall, went dormant in the winter, came out next spring, and at 12 inches tall, we went and took our first sample. So what we do is we cut a square, or we measure a square two feet by two feet square, and we take a pair of scissors and clip everything in that square at the ground level in that two foot by two foot square, we do the two foot by two foot because then we can take the calculation and know how much of an acre that is because we need to know to get to these numbers. We clip that material off, put it in a bag, overnight it to the lab, and boom, this is the numbers you get. Now, I'm going to be willing to say that most of the cereal rye that gets terminated in the United States gets terminated at 12 inches tall because nobody wants it to get out of control. Okay. It's done some good, but there is a lot more to go here. Now, I want you to look at the nitrogen column, the 0060 column, and the biomass column. You can start to see already at 12 inch tall rye, that, pro or that plant has 82 pounds of nitrogen in it. You're beginning to understand why we need to bring nitrogen into the front part of the corn planting program. Four days. In four days, it grew to 18 inches tall. I think you could sit in a chair and watch it grow in, in the spring. It grows that fast. Look at the nitrogen now, 120 pounds. One thing I forgot to add, I told you this was a cornfield, planted the rye. It's going to be a bean field in the spring. Okay, we're going to plant beans into this rye at boot stage. Our potash now is up to 213 pounds. Our biomass has doubled in four days. This is powerful stuff. This is why I preach and preach and preach about farming green. If we would have terminated this at 12 inches, we wouldn't have gotten to these benefits. Look at 28 inch tall rye. 
134 pounds of nitrogen, 281 pounds of potash, 6,800 pounds of biomass. Now we're talking. This is now going to suppress weeds for the most part until we can get to canopy. Okay, thank goodness when I did this, I came back two months after termination and we took another sample because now you can see what was released and available for the plant. Look at the, do the math between 281 and 65 on the 0060 column. And you understand why the 70-30 rule is in effect. Look at the biomass now. It almost was cut in half in two months. Those beans have got to be getting to canopy because now that, that thatch or that mulch we put down is starting to get holes in it and the sunlight's coming down in it. Okay, now I do not buy into the fact that cereal rye has an allopathic effect on corn. I buy into the fact that cereal rye is sequestering the nutrients that the corn needs. Here's the proof right here. So, and not only that, but I also think this is why we don't have broadleaf weeds early in this system. Not only is the cereal rice sequestered the nutrients that those early germinating weeds need, but it's growing at a rapid pace and it is shading those weeds out and absolutely crushing them. We typically don't have any broadleaf weeds. We then roll this down. And as you can see, it starts to release these nutrients back to the profile. And then what's happening is it's feeding the grass. The grasses are the late germinating weeds of the system. And right in time for this flush of the, of the nutrients out of this cereal rye. So once we understand how these things work, the cause and effect, we then change the triggers. So for example, if you had a field that was what was bad in foxtail, put it into wheat, you can get that wheat crop off before the foxtail gets started, put a, another cash, uh, cover crop out, smother that foxtail out. Or if you have the ability, build some, some fence, move some cattle in and graze it off or clip it off and then get ready and put your next, uh, your final cocktail out for your cash crop for next season. Again, Mother Nature is sending us the signals. We just have to figure that out what she's telling us and then make good, good decisions with that. What drives our system? It's all about building soil health. I will sacrifice yield every single day to maintain soil health. I've worked too hard to get to where we are on this farm to lose it with the one pass of a pyrethroid. I'm not gonna do it because we will kill too many beneficials along the way. Diversification, we have to have cover crop diversification. I have mentioned here that cereal rye and soybeans are tremendous together, but that's not good enough. We have to get that cocktail out soon enough in the fall, and I mean 45 days before that freeze event, and start adding warm season species to it. Sorghum Sudan, radish, sun hen, sunflower, cow peas. Get the diversity that the system needs. Cash crop rotation. Now, I know you can only plant cash crops for what you have a market for. I understand that. But I told you at home, our farmers seem to think there's only two markets, corn and beans. We have six now. Get creative. Logistics have changed dramatically. We are hauling our soybeans now two hours one way. But we are being paid organic prices for those soybeans. So don't think your market has to be right out your back door. Data collection. It's not only data collection, it's what do we do with that data that we collect? We've been collecting it for 20 years. I think we do a pretty good job of utilizing that data to our benefit. Armor the soil. I've already talked about this. It's imperative to armor the soil. Building human health. We don't think about this enough. There's a couple of ways I'm talking about here. 
We don't have enough nutrient density in our food anymore. Our soils are dying and we can't get the nutrient density off the current farming practices. That's one way of building human health. The second way of building human health is eliminating the harmful pesticides and herbicides and insecticides and all of those other synthetic attributes that I think we no longer need. I am tired of exposing our family members and our team members. I'm not doing it anymore. No more. Being a good steward. That is one of the most self-explanatory words there is. Steward. If it's way beyond soil health. If you've got a tile hole, go out and fix it. Because all that's doing is sucking dirt in and nutrients and sending it down the stream. If you've got a wash or a cut in your field, fix it, build a waterway. Be a good steward. ROI, return on investment. This is one of the ways we look at profitability. Now, one of this is this slide's done, okay? What you don't see on here is yield. Yield does not drive our system. These items right here drive our system. If you complete everything on this list, you will have yield. It will come along for the ride, okay? Please do not get hung up on yield. We are striving to be a low cost input producer and still maintaining or increasing yield. And by the way, that is my definition for soil health. As inputs go down and yields go up, how could you not be building soil health? Everything I've been talking about is heading toward balance, a symbiotic relationship with mother nature. Predator to prey, bacteria to fungi. One of the questions I always get asked is how can you plant non-GMO corn without insecticide? It's because our system is heading toward balance. The, the organism that preys on corn rootworm is prevalent enough in our system to keep the corn rootworm at bay. Now, I'm not saying that they aren't eating roots, but they are not eating an, at enough of a rate to harm yield. Balance. Bacteria to fungi. When we started down this journey several years ago, one of the things that we implemented was the Dr. Rick Haney soil health test. This is critical to seeing where you are. Now remember, this is like any other test. It's a snapshot in time and you are to view this as looking at trends. That's the way I view this because it's a single snapshot in time. If you were to come back to that same location in a week, you possibly could get different results. So you have to remember this. So when you do this Haney test and we do everything, we do the PLFA, we do the Solvita, we do CO2 burst, we, we look at everything that's on this test. It has a plethora of information. And two of the things on it are what I just talked about, predator to prey and bacteria to fungi relationships. When we started this journey, we were a bacterial-based farm. Now we are a fungal-based farm and that's exactly where I wanna be. We have to do everything we can to promote the growth of fungi and the, and the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi because they are the communication backbone of the microbial network. If any transaction is gonna happen across that network, it is going through the mycorrhizal fungi. Change is good. I know this is difficult. I am not here today to criticize the way anybody farms. That's not what I'm about. What I am about though, is to maybe show you one or two other ways to incorporate into your current system but it takes change. We have to start doing it different than the way dad did it and the way grandpa did it. No offense to them, but let's change and change for something that I think is gonna be necessary in the future. 
I'm not saying that we're going to be mandated the way we farm. That's too strong of a word, but I am saying there may be programs coming in the future that are going to constitute that if you want to get maximum payout, you might need to change the way you farm into a soil health building process. Change is the answer, but it all starts with that first small step. I never know who my audience is, so I just put up this picture of the row unit. This is a corn row unit. As you can see, there's no uh, row cleaner and there's no no-till coulter, but there is a prescription tillage technology double disc opener. Write that down and call the company. That is the best double disc opener blade I've ever used. It's a serrated tooth blade. It creates a U trough instead of a V slot. It, it eliminates hair pinning. Hair pinning is when you are planting into this high residue system that we are. Instead, instead of taking that residue down, it lifts it, actually lifts it up like that. And that's good because you don't want it in the seed slot with your seed. And with that serrated blade, it has a crumbling effect as it's rolling through the field. So it's starting to close the dirt on top of the kernel already before uh, Steve Martin's spader wheel even gets there. Now we plant corn three inches deep and beans about an inch and a quarter deep. I like to be deep because we've got so much residue to go through. I wanna make sure we've got the seeds down with good seed to soil contact. Weapon of mass destruction number one against weeds. Now, I do not care what your color is or what your flavor is. I sell nothing. I'm only showing you our equipment here. That is a 1996 model. You do not think you have to go out and buy something new to start changing your farming practices. The important thing is to get the cover crop established and get it established as soon in the fall as we possibly can. We have shortened our relative maturities of our cash crops tremendously. Uh, let me tell you exactly where we live in the region of the world so you just know. We are on the Illinois, Indiana line, 15 miles north of Interstate 74. We are exactly in line with Lincoln, Nebraska to the west and Philadelphia to the east. So that tells you where we are in the world. We have to get started planting our cover crops, particularly the, the warm season ones that are going to winter kill by the first week in September up until about October the 10th. So we got about 40 days to get it done. Weapon of mass destruction number two against chemicals. This is my baby. This is the INJ 60 foot roller crimper. I told you that we are living in a world of organic with no tillage. So we have to terminate the cover crops with either the roller crimper or cash crop canopy. But it's mostly done with the roller crimper. Gunslinger. This is a cocktail that I came up with that's going to go out in the fall, and you're going to plant corn into this next spring. Now, if I was to tweak this, which I, I'm going to, I need to change this slide, but I would tweak this by adding five pounds of Velana uh, Harry Vetch. And I would also consider moving into, instead of the Austrian winter peas, Grassland Oregon has a survivor pea and Keith Burns at Green Cover has a Wyoming pea. They both are showing tremendous promise toward surviving the winters in the Midwest and coming out in the spring and then growing along with this, with this legume. In four days, the nitrogen goes to 262 pounds. The K2O is off the chart and look at the biomass. 12,700 pounds. We are now ready to no-till corn into this and suppress weeds and feed the corn. Thank goodness I did the same thing. I came back on July 24th and pulled another sample. Look at what has been exhausted out of this cocktail. 
or this, this fixation clover. This is unbelievable. Now, I have done this for a long time and we could argue about how much nitrogen is available today. We could argue all day long. I know from the testing we've done, I'm taking half of that credit now. So on that June 8th, that's the day we pulled in and planted this field. And again, I could have backed up to say June the 1st and still taken advantage of all this and then roll crimped it on June the 8th, but we didn't. We did it on this June the 8th and I'm gonna take half of that credit now. That's 130 pounds. Now, this is where you've got to get realistic with your thinking. Do I wanna raise 220 bushel corn? You bet. I wanna do that all day long, but we can't. So what we are gonna realistically do is 140 bushel corn. My rule of thumb is 0.8 pounds or 0.8 units of N per yield of bushel, bushel of yield. So 140 bushel corn at 0.8 is about 114 or 112 pounds of N. We've got it. I haven't even taken into account all the nodules that are underground and what we're gonna uh, mineralize in our system. The point is there is an abundance of nutrients below our feet. Start reducing the synthetic load and start taking advantage of this natural load working with mother nature. I mean, the nitrogen around us is free. We might as well take advantage of it. And as you can expect, this is a, has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 20 to one, and it is burning up in a hurry. Look at the biomass from June the 8th to July 24th. Look at the organic carbon, 5,200 pounds per acre. I also call this the power of patience. There's the field. It's just, I can't, I can't tell you how awesome it is to plant into that. This is how we feed and suppress weeds. I got to keep moving. I'm running out of time. This is how we, we want to plant soybeans right here. We are planting beans at boot stage of the cereal rye. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come behind this with that that I and J roller crimper, and we're gonna roll everything down when the beans are at anthesis. But this is the way we wanna plant soybeans right here. That same row unit I showed you, there's no coulter, it's just a double disc opener, and we're going right through there and planting beans. Now, this cereal rye is way beyond anthesis, but it was wet, and this was as soon as we could get here, but this is what I wanna show you. Look at, look at what you're gonna see here. There's the soybeans growing that we plant. And by the way, that field that you saw the planter planting is this field here, same field. I'm showing you the progression of time. Look at that aggressive I and J roller, look at that thing. It is flat in this field. The, the cereal rye is down for the count, it's gone, it's terminated. And now look at those beautiful soybeans ready to come up through that, that canopy. There it is. Our weed suppression has already been working. I mean, look, there's no weeds here. No broad leaves, nothing right here. Same field on July 19th. Look at this. Okay, so again, I mentioned to you, you don't have to come with me all the way over because we're not going to do anything to this field. We're going to let it go to harvest. You don't have to come over there with me, but come some of the way and eliminate your burn down pass and now scout this field and you might get by with zero chemicals. So this opens up the opportunity to start reducing input costs and stop blasting all these, these harmful things onto our soil. Input reductions. From 11 to 20, I put these, I put these up here. Um, almost a 50% reduction in diesel fuel, and, the, and there's two main reasons. Number one's right there. We've cut our horsepower way down. We've gone from 3350 to 1200. We don't need all that big power anymore. We're not pulling heavy deep till equipment anymore. I mean, when we pull our planter through our fields, they are so mellow. Our planters are running at about 1600 RPM. The tractor is 1600 RPM to pull a planter, a 60 foot planter through the field. No more in, no more MAC, no more potash, no more lime, and no more chemistry. 
These are things that's taken many years to get here, but now the benefits are humongous. Those same uh, inputs are now put into a dollar. Diesel fuel savings, synthetic end savings, map, potash, lime, chemistry. Now, look at that number, $828,000. And folks, I don't even have everything in here. I don't have labor in here, and I don't have what taking all that horsepower out means on the depreciation schedule. This number is easily over a million dollars, easily. And everything you see on this page is an average of what our inputs would cost us because the, the cash crops vary from year to year. So I tried to just take averages. And that is a number that's repeatable every single year. Okay, this is a test that I'm extremely excited about. Grassland, Oregon has a survivor pea. And I believe it was bred in, in north, northern uh, state of uh, New York. Okay, we planted this pea three inches deep on November the 1st. I told you where I live. We get cold. This was just before the ground froze. And what we did was we planted this pea into uh, wheat and into a field that was going to be corn in this, in this next spring of 21. What I'm trying to, and I left test strips, what I'm trying to do is to see if we can plant a pea in November and give us that legume that gives us the nitrogen to feed the cash crop in the spring. If this works, this will open up the window by 30 days of all of those Western and Northern states. And this will be huge to get another legume planted in a wider window, okay? That picture you see there was taken on December the 10th. I just stuck the spade in the ground and up came three pea plants, three worms, and who knows what else came up with it. And I got a quarter there for size relationship. Absolutely perfection. March the 6th, here we go. This is exciting. Look at that pea and there's the wheat in the background. This pea survived the winter and we had a pretty tough winter, folks. We had a stretch there three weeks ago of seven days below zero. Uh, this is that ongoing test that I talked about. I don't know if this pea can feed the nitrogen that the, the wheat needs because they're both gonna mature about the same time, but I'm fairly confident that it's gonna be able to feed the nitrogen that the corn needs. Now, what we're planning on doing here is harvesting the pea and the wheat at the same time, and then we're gonna separate them and we'll have two crops. So what's cool about these peas is for a really easy rule of thumb, for every bushel of yield, they fix two pounds of nitrogen. It's not quite two, but it's pretty close. If we could somehow raise 40 bushel peas, we're fixing 80 pounds of nitrogen that maybe isn't available for this cash crop, but should be available for that next cash crop. So very exciting times, very exciting. Okay, I gotta move quick through this, I'm about out of time. I sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. I do it every single day. You have to be in that mindset. Eliminate crop insurance. We no longer take, I haven't had it now for three years. No CFAP government subsidy payments, period. I took none in 20. I actually, and also not only did I not take any or not do the crop insurance, I have no longer signed up for any uh, government programs. I am not going to be hypocritical. I'm not going to stand here and present to you and tell you to take everything away and then have my hand out for a government subsidy payment. I'm not doing that, folks. This system is stable enough on its own. We can do this without any help. Plant green into living cover crops. Plant beans in the 72 inch tall rye. This can be done. Plant corn into cereal rye. It can be done. I explained why you need to change your nitrogen program. 
it's okay to have 12 plans. In 20, I used every letter of the alphabet. It's okay. I've already made plan changes for 21 and it's only March. Slow down and look for validations. I mentioned the no ag lime in seven years and the pH is still at 6.8. Park your planner no matter the date. I don't care if your neighbors are out running, don't be in your fields until the fields are fit to be in. And always resort back to number one, sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. I have no equipment to fix the ruts that I could do in the spring if we're out there too soon, so I'm not gonna do it. Do not plant corn in April again. This is perfect because I've been taught by Dr. Aaron Silva at the University of Wisconsin to plant beans at boot stage in cereal rye, which in my region is in that last week of April, first week of May. And then we're gonna plant all of our beans while we're waiting for that fixation clover to do its thing. And that's always after Mother's Day in our region. So this is a perfect fit. Plant beans first, corn after Mother's Day, and, and you walk away. Totally eliminate all inputs and that includes manure except for where we have alfalfa. And where we have alfalfa, we are still bringing the solid waste manure back because it's too much removal of nutrients when you take that manure or that alfalfa away. Grow the nitrogen we need with legumes. Regen acres, I talked about that. We have to stop looking at single year snapshot ROI. Look at the average of like your six crop rotation and then you'll see the regen starts to make sense. Certified organic with no tillage, three passes. That's a pass in the fall of getting your cover crop established, a no-till pass in the spring of planting your cash crop and a roller crimper pass of terminating the cover crop. To truly be regenerative, you have to take everything away, and I mean everything, and I know that's a very bold statement, and someone may argue with me on that, and that's fine, but I am still entitled to my opinion, and my opinion is this is the way to truly be regenerative. If we are constantly tearing down the, the microbial biome, and all they do is spend their time rebuilding that back just in time to be wiped out again by another tillage pass, they're not doing anything for us to build soil health. So we have to take everything away. If you are not uncomfortable with what you are doing, then you are not trying hard enough to change. Think about that for a moment. If all we're doing is sitting and pressing the easy button, we're not trying to change. I challenge everyone here today to get a little uncomfortable I think you will like how it feels. I'm proud to be a farmer, but I am way more proud of the way I farm. I call it regenerative stewardship. Thank you very much. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. <clears throat> that was a fascinating and uh, very passionate PowerPoint presentation. And we have um, approximately 10 minutes for questions. If you're okay with a few questions, Rick? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> we'll start at the top. Um, the first question is actually a machinery question um, around the fact that the roller crimper they've got doesn't actually terminate a lot of cover crops. They begin to regrow afterwards. Uh, is this a problem with our roller crimper or with the cover crop species itself? Yeah, that could be twofold. I don't know what kind of roller crimper they have, but what we have found now through a lot of testing and a lot of pain is there are certain species that we cannot terminate or control with that roller crimper, like rape, for example, tremendous cover crop. And it'll probably come with you, survive the winter and be there almost every single spring, but we cannot terminate it with the uh, crimper. So I can no longer use it. Mm. So yes, my guess is to answer their question, it's probably a combination of both. 
Now, also in that INJ crimper I showed you, we have those barrels full of water. So we have the maximum amount of weight that we can get on that rig without, well, we could add weights to it, but for what the engineers want, we have it maxed out. And that's a production option on that system, is it, Rick? Right. You can buy these off the shelf and put water in them. That is correct. Okay. I think the second part of that question you've already answered anyway. Uh, what cover crops are you successful in actually terminating? I think you you've know, been the, through that now. Yeah, the pseudo rye is obviously number one. So when you when you get to where you you now need to think about diversity, because pseudo rye is a monoculture by itself, and that's dangerous. So like I said, we've got to go back, and you've got to get these out there in time to get that diversity and then take advantage of those species that will winter kill. So then next spring, all you're left with is that cereal rye to roll down with that roller crimper or the fixation clover and a hairy vetch, something like that, or a pea. Those are things that can be then terminated with that roller crimper. And I think it's, I think it's as you said in your presentation, Rick, timing is critical. Yes, yeah. Um, the next question is slightly more complex in some ways. Can you talk about the plant health pyramid and how healthy plants can repel pest insects? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that concept. I think that again, another reason why we are where we are in our system is because of that diversification that that requires, that crop rotation, all of those things lead to healthier soils, which then in turn will keep your pests at bay. And remember, we've got to constantly change what the pest is looking for. So, you know, when, when you raise corn, for example, that rootworm will come in and, and lay those eggs that could then be the detriment for next year's crop. So we try not to have corn in the system on a field in at least four years and we try five. So, th and then when you can bring the cattle into it, the grazing is another huge benefit to this soil health or, or this pyramid. And we constantly are keeping the, the pests, uh, for lack of a better word, confused about where they need to be in this system. Right. And I guess as well, it's what you said in your presentation that without the use of pesticides, You've got a healthy supply of predator bugs in the soil at all times anyway. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Do you plant the same cover crop mix in all of your fields, regardless of what the next cash crop is going to be? No, no. Um, I, ahead of soybeans, it's going to be cereal rye. And if, again, I'm going to try to get it as, in as timely fashion I can, I'm going to put some some oats in there with it. I'm going to put cow peas, sun hemp, uh, sunflower, uh, things that are going to winter kill because of there being a warm species. And then things that go ahead of corn, I'm trying to um, put those, those things like gunslinger, add hairy vetch to it. But again, we've got to be careful on which species are going to survive the winter and be around next spring because we are trying to terminate mechanically with that crimper. Now we do also have a flail chopper and we could use a flail or flail more, whatever you wanna call it. We could come in and do that as well. But let me throw out another, another thing here. I know we're probably getting close to running out of time. But when you think about when we're rolling these crops down, they are dropping pollen, for example, that cereal rye is dropping its pollen. The lignin is at the highest in that plant, and you could terminate that field with just walking across it. Your feet stepping on a plant and flattening it has terminated that plant. That fixation clover, if you look at those blooms closely, they were already starting to turn brown around the perimeter. It's pretty much done its thing. Mm -hmm. So terminating it is not as hard as you think it is because it's almost done everything it's supposed to do in its life. So the stem is already weak and it's ready to go over. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think this last question, Rick, is, is kind of a statement and kind of a question. Um, 
You can roll over the young soybean sprouts, as you showed with rolling the brown rye. Um, how much damage do you see, question mark, or is the damage to young uh, soybean sprouts? No, there, there's very little damage. And actually what's happening here is a tremendous phenomenon. The roller crimper is, is um, affecting the apical bud in such a fashion that it's now sending a signal to the plant to tell itself that we need to stack more nodes. And that is a beautiful thing because when you stack nodes, that gives you more opportunities for pods. So when you look at our soybean plants, our nodes are two to three inches apart instead of six to seven inches apart. So it's a tremendous thing, but we have to be careful though that once you get beyond V3, you're gonna start shredding leaves and probably breaking branches off. So it is critical there. And the reason why the planting at boot stage and rolling at anthesis works is because that's about 40 days. And in 40 days, your beans will be around that V1 and a half to V2 and a half growth stage. That's why it all works together like that. So it's not a timing thing by the date on the calendar. It's going out and scouting the field and what is the growth stage of that cereal rye. Right. <laughs> okay, I think um, we've got a few more questions coming in, but we will have to answer these at a late date, later date now, unfortunately. Um, a really big thank you again to you, Rick, for taking some time out of your day to present to us. You're welcome. That's been fantastic. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the audience. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, and so without further ado, I will now turn over to Steve uh, for the final wrap up of today's proceedings. Thank you again. Thanks, Rick. Rick, so great to see you. Um, I says, we met a year and a half ago in Springfield um, and I was blown away by your talk then. I said, we've got to bring you to this conference and it took us a little longer than we originally assumed, but um, fantastic presentation. All the presentations today were just great. So much great information. Um, so I, um, I'm, um, for those that weren't there at the beginning, I'm Steve Thompson. I'm the executive director of NCAT. And uh, we are done for the day. Um, just a couple little reminders before we log off. Um, feel free to stay um, and, and browse the Whova platform. Visit our sponsor pages, the poster session, um, the virtual ex exhibition booths, um, participate in chats um, in, in the topic discussion area. Um, tomorrow we get started at um, 9.30 Mountain Time. 8.30 th um, Pacific, 10.30 Central, and um, 11.30 um, Eastern. Um, please remember to uh, return to the agenda um, and complete feedback forms for all the sessions you attended today. Um, very helpful to us to get your feedback. Um, and I think that's all we have. So have a wonderful evening. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a good day.